Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I am among the curious minds and uh, disruptors in various forms and fashions that we won't go into too much detail on these intros. But uh, with me, as always, is Mr. Mark Fielding. Mark, uh, how are you, sir? And it looks like you're back home, huh? Yes, I'm back home. I'm out of a box. Looks like you're in a box. I'm doing great. Yeah. Um, if I was a drumbeat, I'd be the Amen Break today. I'm feeling good. Amen Break. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe uh, next time I'll hook up, hook up, hook up my mic, and we'll drop one real quick. That might be fun. Yeah. Um, uh, can we just before we oh, let's get the audience involved straight away? So we're talking yes. about music. You love music. Obviously, there's a drum kit behind you. I've got some CDs. I'm interested in what the CDs. Thinking on, I know. CDs. Yeah. Tell me about wow. it. Oh, what does a thinking on paper community listen to? So if there's anyone drop their songs of the moment, their favorite artists in the chat, if we could get some names up there just so we can yeah, see what the community likes to listen to. That's a great That's idea. Great. And I've actually I've actually toyed with the idea. I did a live stream a long time ago that actually had uh, a musical guest every time. So uh, with our new partnership now with uh, volume.com, uh, volume listeners, yes. hello, another streaming platform. Tons of amazing uh, musicians there. So maybe my friend Ben Holst can get us uh, one to kick off a show. But yeah, music uh, music is one of these intersections, obviously, that's that's super important to me. It's it's the work that I do, the intersection of music, brand, and technology. Uh, the topic today is going to be really fun because we have someone that is uh, that has been in this space, in the innovation space for a long time, but now is really uh, leading and doing some of these projects that a lot of people are talking about in theory but are actually putting stuff out and testing them. So I'm really curious uh, to learn uh, what she has learned and, and, and that sort of thing. So yeah. before we introduce our awesome guest, uh, Mark, you were at Vivitech last week. Uh, we had the AI episode with uh, Reed Blackman that was awesome and I think generated a, a lot of buzz. Um, yeah. any, any other takeaways maybe applicable to our conversation in music today from Vivitech in Paris? Um, that I don't know if there's anything applicable on the top, off the top of my head about that. I guess with the AI question, um, one, I got a question for you. So one of the big battles I have is battling the algorithm. I don't know if you have Spotify, if you do that kind of music or if you're more old school and you go to record shops and peruse yeah. the old 45s and look for the imports and the rare imports. And maybe that's how yeah. you find yes. new music, but how do you how do you create your playlist? How do you find new music? How do you find and where do you find inspiration when AI is just dictating what we all listen to? How do you battle it? I think it's back to like buddies, right? Buddies that you trust that uh, that in you know little pockets, little record labels, little tastemakers here and there, uh, other musicians that I listen to. What are they listening to? I'm always asking them, right? Uh, the the algorithm, the Spotify algorithm thing is really interesting because we have a family plan, right? And I've got kids that are, uh, you know, one is getting ready to go to college. Uh, I've got a rising sophomore, rising seventh grade, rising fourth grade. So when they're in the Spotify account, I mean, my third grader is, you know, putting on like the, you know, the poo song or something. And it's now yeah. in my algorithm, like what in the world? You know, I know there's a way to manage all of that. But anyway, we're, we're digressing. Um, yes, let's jump not. in. We, we've got an amazing guest. Um, Caroline Gigerich, uh, we... Um, are excited to talk to you. I'm going to share a little bit about your background. Background. I want you to uh, add a little bit more to it, but um, we connected originally based on curious minds, I think, and we love unpacking stuff. What I love about what Caroline does is uh, she takes in what's going on tech trend wise. She processes it in a really awesome way and then spits something out that people that are not super technical and not super on trend with, with a particular thing, uh, in, in, a, in a great way. She does it on LinkedIn and she does a lot of other things, but I'm going to bring her on right now. Welcome to Thinking on Paper. Super excited to have you. Um, Super excited to be here. Yeah. Uh, can, I, can I just go to the Spotify thing for a second? Because I've been testing it nonstop. Nonstop. I bike commute to work, so I listen to it nonstop. And uh, I think... I, one, I think you need uh, user profiles like Netflix has to solve the problem that you just mentioned. <laughs> and two, I think they do an amazing job of like reaping the rewards of your listening background. I think it's like hit or miss when it comes to discoverability. Like sometimes I'm like, fire! 
and like yesterday I was biking to work and there was something in there that I was like, really? Just like, yeah, this is completely, this is a left field and not in a good way. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. Right. <laughs> well, maybe the left fielders, uh, help kind of write the ship on the good stuff. Right. Cause you got to got to have the bads to the goods and it feeds the system. I don't know, but it's, is it, is it more bads than goods or are those more outliers? The, at the start, because the algorithm's learning, right? It, yeah. It's more bads than good. Now we're get we're getting a stride, and I love like that it's starting to like really rise up some artists I would never be exposed to. It's good for the artists. It's good for me. Yeah. We're all happy. I just think the more it learns, the better it will get. And so I just keep with it to be like, okay, where where did we start? Which wasn't good. Where can we get to? <laughs> Yeah, yep. it's dangerous on your bike as well because you have to stop to say, "Don't ever play this artist again," and then add some more okay. names to try and trick the algorithm into. This is why I <laughs> one I don't wear uh, AirPods because I'm afraid they'll fly out of my ears when I'm biking. People are like, "You're so old school. You're supposed to be in tech." I'm like, <laughs> I'm just afraid I'm going to lose one of those. So well, I just double click for safety reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good process to me. Well, uh, Caroline, why don't you give us uh, a little bit of background just on kind of what you've been doing over the last few years, your your current role, uh, and uh, and then I want to dig in to this amazing like curiosity driven uh, energy that you have to understand and process tech and help other people understand process and apply tech. So give us a little background. Yeah, for sure. For up top, let me just say thank you uh, for that opening because. I work really hard to demystify tech all the time for people because I don't like that tech people sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, just try to box people out with lingo. So I'm, I am actively trying to provide an equitable space where all sorts of people, technical or not, can come together and share ideas. So thank you for that opening. I am uh, the head of innovation for Warner Music Experience. So at Warner Music Group, it is a separate part of the org that really focuses on ancillary revenue streams for the artists. What do I mean? Um, typically things outside of music. Uh, the labels are principally focused on music. It's the core of an artist. But we really lean in on all of the different avenues around the artist. That could be VIP. It could be tour. It could be retail, licensing. D to C, we have 200 to 300 artist merch stores, for instance. We have a whole media um, part of our network. And we also lean in, and this is a new part of the company that leans into brand opportunities like Ed Sheeran with his hot sauce Tingly Ted's brand. So there's a lot going on in there. <laughs> Was it speaking of Ed Sheeran? Wasn't there an Ed Sheeran moment with ketchup like a while, like a long time ago that he didn't even do the part? He was just like, I love ketchup. Yeah, and what wasn't I that actually something? have it over on the bookshelf. It's a very talented colleague in the UK. His name's Bob. Worked on that with Ed Sheeran. It's called Edship. Edship. That's what. Her <laughs> Edship. Yeah. He. <laughs> I. I begged him to give me one when I was in his office, and because the ketchup is old, he's like, "Okay, but you can never eat it." <laughs> the ketchup is like, you know, it, it's old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it it's really so really interesting what like I want to go back to the thread of processing tech and, and 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 generating outputs that resonate with people that aren't super techie or or don't understand kind of the the higher order first principles of of how kind of communities work and how communities and culture and tech work all in general. What is what is an important thing that you try to do? When you find, because I I read all your LinkedIn stuff that comes out, I think it's so thoughtful. Like, what is one thing you always try to do when you're trying to synthesize an output related to a a, a trend or something that you spot? Yeah, that's a great question. I, and I'm going to give you an oddball answer, but it's the truth. I was a philosophy major, and I took this course in logic, which was about breaking language down into almost like math algebra. Right. So like in its simplest state, if you break language down into algebra, like can you make arguments based on that very fine simplification? So what do I mean? I'm yeah, trying mean? to I, I'm trying to break down tech into the simplest expression of it 
with the shortest amount of words and still provide some like personal flair of like, yeah, and this is what I think about it. Very cool. And you, you definitely have like the personality is still in there. Like I hear, cause we've, we've talked on occasion about, about a lot of things and I can still hear kind of your, your personal voice in that, but li listeners, we've got, uh, we've got philosophy that's come up to the second week in a row and logic and potentially Bertrand Russell and, and not uh, the, just the rapper, but. right? That's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly right. So very, very cool. Well, let's talk about, so I want to move to, to brands. Cause I think that is the kind of the, one of the grand enablers of experiments in emerging tech and music, right? Because we're, we're, we have these, have this new tech, we're trying to figure out the right ways to use it. We want to um, experiment and test and iterate, but you know, a lot of artists aren't going to be like, yeah, sure. I'll pay for that. Like I'll pay for that test. Right. So how can brands start to meaningfully participate in the future of music? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's got to be the right brand, the right artist. And what I mean by that is the fan demos need to be somewhat similar. Like if we're talking about like a brand with a demo of 40 to 54 and you've got an artist with demos of 16 to, you know, 32, this, that's not going to work. And sometimes there's just a misunderstanding between the two audiences Brands kill for the type of artist loyalty that fans provide. Like I recently went to a Melanie Martinez show and I was just blown away by how much her fans adore her. Like I haven't seen this amount of artist love at a show in a while and brands kill for that. And I know because I used to work at brands and we would kill for that. So I know it's enticing from a brand perspective, but it really has to be an authentic connection. I often talk about concentric circles. There needs to be an overlap of demos. There needs to be an overlap of interest. If the artist, for instance, you know, hates Snapple, I'm just making that up. Well, the artist and Snapple together probably isn't a good match. So it just has to authentically resonate. Okay. That, go ahead, Mark. I was just wondering if there's any way that you can, I mean, what, what are the, what are the indicators you're looking for that like is demographic age? Is that the, the main drive of how you choose that? And then uh, in my head, when you said that brands, which have a demographic of like 40, 50, 60 might not be as forward leaning into new tech as brands whose demographic is 20, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there, yeah, how, how, how do you discuss, how does that conversation evolve before those brand collaborations come about? Yeah, so a, a lot of what we do is look at data and research. It could be social, social listening tools. It could be other types of tools that are pulling in. This artist, what are her fans big consumers of or his consumers or what have you? Like as an example, I was looking at some artist data one day and it showed that many of this artist's fans were huge Clash of Clans players. Like, and I was like, first of all, that actually makes sense now that I sort of think about that genre. <laughs> but, hmm, is there an opportunity there? Because I know you guys also are big fans of, you know, gaming opportunities. But that's a good indicator, right? That's a signal. We should lean in and see if there's an opportunity here. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. So, so how do we like new tech can be scary, right? Not, not just for, not just for the artists, not just for the fans, not just for the, I mean, really for everybody, right? Um, scary in a way of like, is it going to be really complicated? Uh, are there, are, you know, am I going to have to learn a whole new language? You know, can I just jump in? Is it crystal clear? Is there value? How do you, how do you, work with all of the stakeholders to try and get them a little more comfortable with a certain type of technology? It's a great question. I am a share your screen kind of gal. And what I mean by that is I got like 10 videos ready to go to show you what I'm talking about. Because if I'm showing it to people, either artist management, artists, my colleagues that don't understand, let's say AR, for instance, 
Well, I'm going to have to show them a whole bunch of examples of what I'm talking about. And I often personally get into this with salespeople who come at me without like a good explanation of UX. If I can't understand your UX, the fan is definitely not going to understand your UX. So like, don't come at me without like your demos ready. They better not have been expired and they better not show me something other than what you're describing, which happens. So pitching the ideas, it needs to visually light up someone's brain, right? Like words, important, text, important, but visuals, super powerful. Like Jeremy, you know this, Mark, you may not, but I come from entertainment background. I worked at HBO. I worked at Showtime, did some work at Netflix. Like I'm a storyteller at heart. And so that's why I wholeheartedly believe in the power of visual storytelling. And that's where I can really go to work with ideas. Um, I, I believe it sounds awesome. Do, in, instead of saying, okay, can we focus in on the emerging tech? So rather than saying emerging tech, can we name what these experiences or technologies or, or tech, what, what they might be? And could we start maybe with one that's quite open and accessible to a lot of musicians and brands, and then maybe going all the way to the other end of the spectrum with something that's totally very, very kind of bleeding edge technology, what they might be. So activations that we've done, is that what you're thinking? Activations that you've done and then perhaps activations which are in concept mode at the moment or might be coming soon that are very okay. kind of cutting edge. Well, um, as I told you before the show, we've done a lot with AR recently with artists and that's very accessible to a lot of them, right? Like they're most of them on social platforms. So they understand filters, be it Instagram, Snap, TikTok, whatever, right? So there's AR lenses that are filters that live on social platforms. That's thing one. Then there's virtual try-on. That's a little bit more mysterious to artists. And I mean, like, could I put a sweatshirt on Jeremy or a t-shirt on you, Mark? We can do that in AR, right? So that's a yeah. little bit more mysterious. And then we have experiential activations, like we did an AR mirror in Melanie Martinez's VIP that allowed fans to walk in front of the mirror and interact with Melanie as if she was right next to them, create a video, do photos so that they have like a lasting, you know, memento from VIP that then gets sent to their email that they can hold on to forever. So AR solves a variety of different challenges. Like, for instance, um, what if we want to bring more visual storytelling to a piece of merch? Guess what? We can do it with AR. What if we want to use AR to push people to artist music, artist merch? Guess what? We can do it with AR. We can add CTAs on top of the AR lenses, for instance, in Snapchat. Um, what if we have an artist who, you know, isn't maybe just doesn't want to do a meet and greet for whatever reason? Maybe it's logistics or I don't know what it is. Guess They're what? Hammered. We've got a solution. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. They're, they're, they're doing rock star things. That's why they don't want to do they're it. Being rock stars, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, I, I get excited about that one because that's easy to talk about and it's easy to show visuals to be like, this is what I'm talking about. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, I think, especially given, you know, where you guys lean in, I think Web3 is getting exceedingly difficult to talk about. <laughs> it's either sensitive <laughs> and I mean, you know, we were talking connected merch earlier yeah. So, Jeremy, you were referencing an example where it was a shoe which had like an NFT as a certificate of authenticity. If I mention the NFT as certificate of authenticity, but like, you know, amongst all sorts of other, you know, videos, like early access to vinyl, like all this stuff, even a mere mention <laughs> could be like, oh, well, we don't want it to be Web3 because there's obviously a lot of pressure on it. There's been some negative fan reactions. Like you, for Web3, 
you really need the kind of artist like an Arden Jones, for instance. He's the guy who did his parallel parking um, track on sound and sold out. Like he is leaned in. He does experiential activations in Web3. His label is like super. They've got like a head of Web3. You know, they are authentically leaned into Web3. And so doing something with him in the space, okay, everybody's authentically connected. And I think in talking with Web3 companies, that's what they want too. They don't want, you know, someone where it's like they're never going to talk about it, but it just happened to exist. I think like you you speak about um, visual storytelling and your reaction to that was was brilliant, Caroline, because I think you really expressed the, the challenges that the music industry is facing with Web3 and NFTs. But it's also quite interesting because recently I did a, a deep research on the NFT collections of 2020 and 2021 and I like month by month and I went through all the releases and there were so many musicians who were releasing NFTs back in 2021 and yeah there was artist backlash there was a bit of a disconnect between what the artists were trying to do and what their fan base thought about it and from what your reaction is that's, they've obviously learned that lesson and dialed everything back. Yeah, I think that's true. Although I, I will say, um, I remember being at Art Basel and watching Spotty Wi-Fi talking about how he thinks about Web3. And he said very simply, I just think about it as another distribution vehicle. And I was like, that's smart. Like it should, you could just put it in your overall roster as one of your DSPs and then you it's just another channel that you activate on and I thought okay that makes a lot of sense it's it's just that artists like so many of us but more so for artists are very splintered on their time and attention you know you can only imagine how much an artist has to see coming at them in terms of opportunities all day so it is um, I can be empathetic to the fact that that one might fall to the bottom for some artists. Yeah. Is it still, is it still like the, the residue of the sketch hype cycle FOMO huh. uh, a bit that's, that's trying to get shaken off because I, I want to clarify that. Like the, 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 I always say the underlying technology that people lump into web three is still pretty interesting. Like you said, as a distribution mechanic, as a, as a, alternate means of connection as a, as a, as a bi-directional way to communicate with your fans where they're able to throw inputs at you. You're able to throw outputs at them and vice versa. What, what do you think? Uh, what do you think of where we're sitting uh, as it states to the residue of the, of the first cycle of all this? That's such a spot on assessment because this doesn't mean we're not leveraging web three tech. Um, we are, we just make it more invisible in terms of the front end UX. Mm -hmm. We don't make it such that log in with your crypto wallet. You know, we're making it back end infrastructure, which is what I always thought Web3 needed to get to to be truly scalable, is not in your face lingo and complicated machinations of user experience, but more back end functionality. The other area that I'm super excited about with Web3 is rewards. You know, I talk about it all the time because it feels like, you know, I worked for Smashbox Cosmetics at some point and we had um, a loyalty program that you can only imagine how strong it was, especially considering Sephora's insider, right? But coming to the music industry and realizing that while social media is an excellent channel for communication one to many, it's not great in making your most engaged fans feel special, you know? And Jeremy, you know this, but Mark, you don't. Like, I started in radio a long time ago as a radio DJ. I spent a, a lot of time with artists and at concerts and all the stuff, right? I did all the stuff. And I saw the people that would show up. They would go to every show on tour. They would buy all the merch. They were like first in line for tickets when you actually had to see them live. Yeah. Um, you know, and these, these people are your gemstones, you know? Like, could you imagine if anyone had that much love for us? Like, 
we would want to be like, you're, you're our OGs. Let's treat you like royalty. And so I'm so excited to see all the solutions that exist in Web3 for artist-specific loyalty. Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely. Re- I mean, I think we we've probably you and I have talked about the the Kevin Kelly thousand true fans reference. I think that is now getting recycled around, but that was an old reference um, that you don't need moonshot million dollar or million fans to make something happen. You just got to have the right ones that are all about you in various ways, and then you keep them happy. What I thought was interesting of one of your recent projects. Well, I guess it was maybe last year. Uh, was it Kevin Gates and the Po app um, that happened at Red Rocks, right? Where basically in the middle of the show, there was a, a Po app that came on the screen for those that attended the concert. It was a QR code they could download and get something special to kind of commemorate that experience. How did that go as an outcome? And, you know, what are you, are you, or is his team currently using that as a point of connection to, to incentivize fans? So the Red Rocks show was principally Atlantic Records. They pulled that off on their own. However, we helped support Atlantic for the big life tour that he did. And it was the same strategy as what you just described. Fans would see the QR code on screen, scan, and then they would receive their digital collectible. And then there was also, of course, the utility layered in for them as well connected to the collectible. So for me and watching the metrics off of that, there's such value in first party data, you know, like artists over time. So there was obviously an era going back to Elvis's time where fan clubs were like a thing, right? And, you know, they would send mailing lists out to their fans and let them know where like Elvis was going to be. And then we went to social media and the social media networks and platforms held all that data themselves. And while the artists had a communication platform, they didn't have the data. And so uh, also with like a platform like ticket companies, (laughs) you know, they don't have as much access to their first party data. So anything that really provides that kind of avenue where they start to have one to one connections without a third party intermediary is super valuable. And as a marketer, that's. I think the ultimate value of POAP outside of like, you know, an additional connection and immersive experience for fans, like underlying, I'm like, okay, this is a long-term connection they're going to have with their fans. What was the fan reaction to that? Was there more engagement than you thought? Was there less engagement than everybody thought? How was it received? (sighs) Yeah, overall it was received really well. Um, I can't remember the cities that did better than others. I can only remember that one of the top cities in performance in terms of like POAP um, redemption was a little surprising to me. And I, I kept thinking, are they more like technical in that city? Again, a part and I can't remember the city, but I was like, I wonder where that is. <laughs> that is really interesting to think about, like just from a geography perspective, who, who is more tech forward? I know there are certain cities, if you looked at the data, there's probably some that jump out. But um, the thing that interests me about all of this is like with the PO app at a concert, you're a fan, you've got your fan base. And with any business, you know, there's the, the idea of customer acquisition cost, right? And, you know, how long does it take to get that first fan, that first buyer in? Yep. And how do we keep them super psyched so we don't have to have that acquisition cost again. So we have the PO app, we have the this point of connection to the audience. I want to know, and I, I don't know how much you know about this, but maybe there's some other references or other projects that you know that are doing this. What happens after and how are they activating through this new established connection? Yeah, you're talking about like long-term, what does the fan get out of it? Mm-hmm. Um, that's paramount importance. It's so important that I put on the request form that it was like a required entry because I didn't want people thinking about this as like a PFP, like a a digital thing that people get sent. Because like, really, what is the point of that? (laughs) Um, it, It varies across different artists, obviously. Like sometimes it'll be like early access to vinyl or merch discounts or Um, sometimes it's like exclusive first access to content. It, 
inevitably funny enough, we're thinking the same way when we're thinking about connected merch. We're like, okay, what's the value that we bring? What duration do we need to bring it over? So like with POAP, right? Is it a one-time thing? You get like one thing and then you're like... <laughs> I've got it, this thing. I've got this thing on my phone now. I don't know what to do with it, but it's here. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then you layer one incentive on it and you're like, okay, we're good. Or is it like a year long? I mean, you, you realize like getting all parties on board for a year of different rewards. It's not like we're a startup or like a very multi-layered type of organization. So it's like between practicality and wanting to deliver on what users should receive it's like a fine balance <laughs> it is yeah, a fine should, balance. should receive that's very important very mm -hmm. important but, yeah but what so with po apps I, i'm interested in po apps and their use because people give po apps for going to like linkedin events and totally. it's, 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 it's ridiculous <laughs> but it may be with po apps could be combined with sbts like soulbound tokens where you could use i don't know if you get 10 po apps you get an, a, a soulbound token Po app from the artist, which gives you obviously a lifelong loyalty card for that artist. And then, then the, the artist is kind of free to experiment because they, they could try different loyalty rewards. They can try different things. They can try different access points and it gives a whole new use and value to the Po app rather than just having, you know, you went to a concert, here's a picture, whoop de whoop. That's right. Well, and what you honestly just described, you could do with POAP. You could do with other tokens, frankly. Like you yeah. could do badges um, for different, you could even do badges for different types of activities that are tokens, right? So like, I love what you said. It's something we're actively thinking about and concepting against because I think the real value is rewarding fans for what they're already doing. We're not asking them to do anything else. They're just already doing all sorts of things that are very valuable to an artist. So how do we tokenize some of that? How do we reward it? What are the incentives? What is the length? All of that stuff. I mean, even many teams outside of mine as well are all thinking about this. Yeah, I do think. You call, do you call them PO apps or do you call them something else? Because we were talking about fidgetals and the lexicon of Web3 and emerging. Tech. I hate calling them PO apps. And yes. I know <laughs> if anyone from PO app watches this, I'm so sorry. But <laughs> every time I say it, and first of all, they say PO op and I say PO app. Ah, po <laughs> so op. there's that. Sounds I just like can't, post op. Post -op. I can't get my head around it. But also, every time I say it, every time someone's like, "What is it?" <laughs> I think I think about it too. I, I always and I I try to figure out how to shake out the lexicons and and the the jargon, right? And really think about what this stuff is. And I'm curious on your opinion of how my brain works on this one. Is I think of it as audience infrastructure, and you're building mm. these like direct roads and pathways to your super fans that you can automate experience or make it easier to have this unique experience back and forth. Is that the right way to think about it? Or is that, is there another way that, that I can spin a perspective on it? I personally think about it exactly the same way. And so walking through your brain for a second was like scary, but like interesting <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> yes. I, I agree wholeheartedly. Got it. Got it. What's, um, Mark, do you have any more on this on this kind of line? I want to flip it over to to some other ideas. Um, uh, yeah, um, I'm I'm good with that one. Um, let's go. Move on. This this was one question that uh, that I had that I think um, we had talked about a little bit. But you know, there's with with emerging tech and especially like you know the the, the Apple thing that just came out and all the things that are going on. About I haven't seen it. I haven't played with it. I'm not special enough yet. I don't think. <laughs> um, maybe I'll get one. Uh, but I'm not special either. Yeah. It, it, so but, if anyone wants to send one to us or have us demo one, please get in touch. To the Thinking on Paper Experience Lab located at. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, the, the idea just we're, we're going back high level, right? Less less in the weeds. There, there's where where is the inflection point sit between when emerging tech comes out and someone goes, oh, that's kind of cool. That'd be nice to have to like, 
oh my gosh, I have to have it, right? And it's it's cycles of innovation, but where where do you see that inflection point happening or where have you seen it in the past that could potentially be applicable to the future? So a few thoughts. Um, a few things immediately come to mind. I also TA for Scott Galloway's section company, which is a variety of like higher ed classes. Hmm. And all of them are filtering through my brain. One is called de-risking new products, which is about assessing market demand. But the one that I always go to is the jobs to be done framework. And the jobs to, to be done framework is breaking down how your product services customers across three layers. Functional. So if we're talking about a Nike shoe, it would be like something to cover your foot and protect it from the dirt. <laughs> Functional. Emotional, right? Nikes is, well, maybe they make me feel like strong or maybe they make me feel like I'm cool or whatever the emotional connection is. And then the last layer is social. So like, how do my Nikes connect me to you? Maybe Jeremy, you're wearing the same pair and we're like, oh my God, same shoes. So I always think of, okay, how am I going to break this down into these layers and how powerful are these layers? Like, is that you, you literally, your words were need to have and nice to have. Is it a need to have? Is it a nice to have? And then on the product side, what are we talking about? Like, what does the, the, the fan, user, customer need to give up to get it? Cost, time, travel, whatever it is. And after looking at all that, if you're like, yeah, no, I could see it, then I think we're in the green. If it's okay, well, not there yet. There's a niche community that will strongly get on board. Then obviously start with your niche community, but if you want to scale, it's going to need to expand on those jobs to be done, or you're still going to sit with this niche community. So that's how I think about it. Man, I'm a sucker for frameworks. I love that. No, right? that's, that's super Stop. cool. So you said, so you said functional, you said emotional, emotional. and social. Yes. Very cool. What do you think? And about I, that, obviously, Mark? I didn't break that up. It, it was by a professor who's much smarter than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's great. That's great. What are your thoughts on that, Mark? Is it as is a framework and by the by the things that you've seen? I, I, I wonder which is the most. Um, I guess you focus on the emotional. Is that the most powerful of the three steps? I I think that's a great question, and I think it varies by customer, right? Like, to me. I know Galloway talks about this all the time. He talks about signaling with what you wear. And since I'm in the merch business, I also think about that a lot. Like, but sometimes it's more about like the softness of the material, like uh, the Adidas um, Board Ape Yacht Club sweatshirt. And, and I've told this to Erica at Adidas, like my main reason for wearing that all the time is the quality of that thing. She knows, I told her is insane. It is the softest thing that I have ever put on my body. And sometimes I don't even remember I'm wearing it and people are like, oh yeah. the." <laughs> so I, I don't think about it as signaling as much as I think functionally. It just, just, it, it's like a, it's like a soft hug. <laughs> That's really interesting. And it could be a different thing for you for different products and experiences, yes. right? Like some, in some cases you like to flex the, you may like to flex the social cred of, uh, of a shoe or a connected community. You want to be a part of that community. You feel like you're part of that community and you lean into that as well. That's really interesting. It's kind of a spectrum that, that can happen I with do that. I think it's a spectrum. So I, it's not an easy answer. And maybe for certain products, you can say, okay, in this product, we think um, emotional is going to be the winning feature set because most of the users like assign value to the product this way. Well, since we're um, talking about it's, it's like a warm hug um, and and materials and and clothing and we're wary of time. Could we talk about well, NFCs and events sevenfold and yes. and is that is was that like a warm hug? I haven't. Okay, first of all, I ordered my Avenged Sevenfold <laughs> merch, but I haven't picked it up from downstairs yet, so I don't actually know how to respond. <laughs> it's literally there today. It's here. It's downstairs. I just oh, haven't amazing. gotten it. We could have an unboxing live. 
where I go. I get it. I come back. Um, so I don't know about uh, that. I think their designs are dope. They're so great. Um, we didn't work, work on their merch, but I think they're, they're great. And um, Avenge Sevenfold came out with the biggest connected merch drop that I've ever seen. And I mean, it was very large. It was connected to their apparel, to their physical audio as well on vinyl and CDs, of which CDs, I know, Mark, you're a big fan. <laughs> oh, massive fan. <laughs> um so i i was that's impressive that's you know coming out of the gate like we did an atlantic 75 again i worked with atlantic to support them on their 75th anniversary t-shirt and we dropped a a very small number compared to what they did so uh, respect to that team (laughs) um but overall i think nfc is about taking a piece of an apparel and turning it into a launch pad for an overall experience for an artist. And what I mean is you're talking about a way to launch content off of the shirt. So it could be backstage videos from the artist, like Verite was doing um, a connected merch drop on tour where she was doing backstage videos to her fans that would you know, like be notified via SMS and fans would get them. And that's that type of authentic experience to people that are already showing up for you is super powerful. Maybe it's like you talked about Avenge Sevenfold doing the early access to tickets. Maybe it's that folks that have that apparel are now able to buy tickets before everyone else powerful like in the case you mentioned it was the 10,000 people that bought the death bats club tokens right that could get tickets early nfc it it is partially could be a tokenized experience in the sense that there could be an nft a certificate of authenticity doesn't have to be but it is of many of them right so that tokenized ability to open up experiences like early access to tickets is absolutely things that we can do with an NFC experience. So again, trying to, trying to take it to an analogy, it's almost a, a, a wormhole for artists, fans, you know, super fans to get into something, but a physical, like I could scan my shirt or do some kind of activation of my shirt uh, and get to these videos and get to these experiences. What if we flip it? Have you thought about pushing it into something like if I'm wearing this shirt and I go to the concert and Mark goes to the same concert, my experience is different because of my ba- my my badge, right? Or whatever this thing is. Is it going that direction, do you think? We have thought of that. Also, just to give a shout out to one of the coolest teams I know, 90CC. I loved what they did at NFT NYC where they did like the treasure hunt. Oh, I read about this, what you uh, said. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about it. So fun. Um, You went to first stop was getting the merch free. So this was a big awareness play for 90 CC. They're a premium web three apparel brand. So the first stop you picked up a hat, there were different colors and the different colors were just like different rarities of NFTs, which, I was, I was, that it just as is fascinating because Web3 thinks that way in, in rarities, but like the rest of the world does not. And so to, th- to see it brought to a physical product, like the fuchsia, the bright pink was the most rare. So like, if you had a fuchsia, you were even cooler, you know, and like black was the least rare. So you're like, oh, you got a black. <laughs> It's almost like my kids sitting on Fortnite talking about like the skins epic versus legendary and all of this, like, oh, that's just a basic or whatever. It's the same nomenclature, right? Yeah. And then while you were supposed to go to all of these stops in New York City, the idea was that you would collect a POAP from a disc that would live in the physical location that you would tap the NFC and it would give you a POAP. And so as you went to the map, imagine all these little circles with like, different designs for the different locations would start to light up. And, you know, as, as a New Yorker who's lived here a long time, like I was experiencing different places in New York that I had never been to before. So that was very cool. 
Second thing was as you went to the different locations, you were encouraged to tap other people's merch and collect a POAP from their merch so that it encouraged this type of community. Pros and cons, like I would say some people were literally like just walking up to other people and like tapping their hat. And you're like, whoa, physical space. <laughs> Um, yeah, how do you protect that? I, you know, it's kind of like because we're so, it's a niche community of people, yeah. it kind of all works out in the wash. Like someone would be like, "Oh, sorry," like, "Hey, <laughs> hey, don't snag my yeah, <laughs> don't snag my digital authentic authentic presence." Yeah, what's going on here? <laughs> Hi, how are you? Right, how about a word first, and we'll talk about it. Yeah, it's almost no, the eth ethics of digital engagement. Yeah, we right. talked about AI ethics last time. Ethics of digital engagement. We moved engagement. to co-op too fast. Yeah, oh yeah, be written. Yeah, that's amazing. Ethics. Well, uh, Caroline, we are. Uh, we want to be mindful of time. I know you're running and gunning and doing a, a, a bunch of amazing things. We we really appreciate. Uh, Thank you so the, much. Your perspective and your chats and and. I, I think out there listening for our community, if you're looking to really understand and get a great perspective on tech without having eight hours to analyze what it all means, I highly suggest you follow some links we'll post in the show notes. Uh, Caroline's got a great perspective and a great way to synthesize things using her philosophical mathematical equations. Thank you uh, so much. So, uh, so any, any closing thoughts for our curious minds and disruptors on the line, Caroline? Oh gosh. Uh, my only last thought is a, is a completely another oddball one, which is thinking on paper really makes me think about one of our artists, Kevin Gates' song. But if you know, you know, and that's all I'll say. People can go look it up. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm in. We're, we have you our will, own treasure hunt. And then you will laugh. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Amazing. Mark, any closing thoughts on your side, sir? No, it's, it's been fascinating and it's, it's, we started the conversation, I think, how I mentioned like brands and the demographics of musicians and artists and how they em embrace that. And I think that as I mean, Caroline, sorry, you mentioned a lot of musicians that I don't know, which obviously I'm demonstrating my age there. And but I think I'm going to have to go check out a lot of these new artists and yes. see what they're actually doing with this tech. And I'm excited to go and do that. Very, Very cool. cool. Well, thank, thank you both. Uh, and to our audience, you want to see some of these episodes or some of our old episodes, thinkingonpaper.xyz. We're on YouTube. We're on Spotify. We're on volume.com. Hit us up if you have a guest idea, a topic idea, or you just want to you know, share a crazy idea with us. We're always open. And uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye.